Until now, our perspective of Saddam's regime has been limited to second- and third-hand information. But today, we hear from a woman who lived under his persecution. Mona K. Oshana was nine years old when she fled Iraq with most of her immediate family. She speaks to us now from the studios of KXEG in Phoenix. Mona, did you have a good show today? Hello, Steve. Yes, we did. Obviously, we're still talking about the election, but it was a very good show, yes. You say in your book, Look Beyond the Fire, that there really was a weapon of mass destruction in Iraq, and that it was a who, rather than an it. What do you mean? The actual danger to the people was the actual leader that came from the people, Saddam Hussein. He was the destruction and the, and the weapon of mass destruction. Reading your book, I got the idea that although Saddam Hussein had not killed as many people as Adolf Hitler, in some ways his cruelty was worse. Any examples come to mind? One example would be that he had a pool of acid, that he would dip people into that acid and pull them out and watch as their skin would peel off of the bone. Another example would be burying people alive. It is only now, nowadays, after the toppling of Saddam Hussein, that they're able to go back and dig up the remains. Unbelievable. If we look at the history of Iraq, we discovered it was carved out of the much larger Ottoman Empire immediately after World War I. The British, who drew the borders, seemed to favor the Sunni Muslims, while your people, the Assyrians, did not fare so well. During the years you cover in the book, they experienced some of the worst persecution in Iraq. Many of us remember the Assyrians from the Old Testament, but we had no idea they still exist today. Would you bring us up to date on your people's story? The Assyrians never stopped existing. It was just the world abandonment of the Assyrians. The Assyrians being the first of many nations that actually completely as a whole nation converted to Christianity. As a result of the peace-loving people that they are, they have been holding up the torch of Christianity on behalf of the free world, promoting, of course, and advocating for freedom. But it's unfortunate that the world, as we're seeing it today, they have just about been decimated to their current population in the Middle East, which is about between 200 and 300,000. It is the abandonment of the rest of the world that did not realize that there was a nation struggling, fighting, standing up for the rights of not only their, their faith, but their identity. The Assyrians, the Chaldeans, and the Christians, they're known by these three names. They were divided by the enemy so that they would actually marginalize them, so they wouldn't be able to unify and be able to stand up for their rights. As with Israel being in the Middle East, if there is no Israel in the Middle East, there is no secularism, there is no common democracy. As with Christians, if Christians disappear from the Middle East, there will not be secularism. All bridges will be burned. I count myself as one of the survivors. The Ottoman Empire that you mentioned, 1915, I lost so many family members. I'm a third-generation survivor. I'm a second-generation survivor of the Semele massacre, which happened in 1933. And of course, I'm a survivor of the current genocide, having to live in America, thank God, and, and survive this genocide. Mona, on a personal level, it sounds like some of the first persecution you remember occurred at school. How is third grade different from first and second? It simply started within the neighborhood, then it went on into the school system. In the third grade, I remember one day going to school, and all of a sudden the teacher announced we were going to have religious studies. And we didn't understand what the religious studies was. Then she announced it was going to be the Quran that we were going to be studying. Now, I had Muslim friends. We never had any problems. But in this point, the Quran was going to be forced upon anyone that would have to study it. I stood up. I don't know why I stood up. I don't know how I stood up. But I stood up and said, this is not my religion and I will not study it. And this is where there was a confrontation with my teacher who basically called me a dirty Christian and said, get out of my sight. And there were about three or four other girls at that time, my friends that were Christians. She kicked us out of uh, her room, of the classroom. Sounds uh, quite traumatic. We know that in the Arab world, uh, women aren't recognized as having the same rights as in the West, and we tend to blame this on Islam. Has this attitude spilled over into Christian groups as well? Oh, absolutely. I mean, many of the people that have immigrated, even if they came here 3, 30, 40, 50 years ago, my father being one, there was nothing that a man could learn from a woman. There is no difference between a man and a woman, as the Bible says. But because we were living in a Muslim nation, 
that uh, didn't advocate for women, if anything. It stripped women of their rights. They were silenced. They were stifled. They were limited. As Saddam Hussein and his Ba'ath regime uh, took over the country, women became slaves. And that actually is just went into the Christian communities. And you see a lot of people right now still healing from a sickness of where a man dominated a woman to the point where, you know, women were battered, they were beaten, they were shunned for speaking up. Mona, what did it take for you and your family to escape from Iraq? A lot of secrecy, a lot of internal planning. We actually had to secretly leave Kirkuk is where we were living. We had to basically, I'm sorry to have to say that, lie our way through because had we been found out, We would have had a restriction on our family's name. We would not have been allowed. And my mother would, in fact, had been either jailed. My dad would have been jailed and could have perished. So secrecy, very secretly, we went from Kirkuk to Baghdad. And then from Baghdad, we went to Jordan. And it was only in Jordan that we were able to breathe and to be able to be free enough to process our immigration documents so that we were able to travel to America. But it was only after we left that we found our voice, we found our freedom and our rights. Well, I'm I'm glad you made it out of the country. Arriving in America, where no one in your family spoke English, must have been somewhat intimidating. Tell us how God provided for you right from the start. You know, we reached the United States of America in Chicago in 1978. It was January. It was very, very uh, cold. It was, uh, you know, we had never seen snow in our life. But thank God we had family that had escaped prior to us coming here that had helped us. For example, my dad, my my sisters, they got a job right away. And the companies and the way that uh, the United States was set up at that time, it was okay to have someone else fill your application. Those, what we call the good old days where they they took you on the merits of how good of a worker you were, or the person that brought you into the company would sponsor you or bring you in to say, I'll teach him. So even though my family didn't speak English, we worked from day one. We got to America on a Friday, and Monday morning, we were all set up to go either those that went to school or those that went to work. But we've been working, and ever since then, by the grace of God, and thank God for our family that was already here. That's amazing. It's been over 10 years since the execution of Saddam Hussein, and now the Iraqi people are facing ISIS. Would you say they are better off, doing just as badly, or are worse off than under Saddam? The situation went from bad to worse to an extreme situation where we have right now, where it's just beyond expression, uh, to a genocide. In order for us to understand, we need to first understand where we are stepping. We need to understand the people. We need to understand the policies, the politics. Religion leads all policies in the Middle East. If we do not recognize that as the driving force, we will always fight a losing battle. Mona, with the experiences you've had, what is your message for America? Why they hated the Christians and the Assyrians who were completely as Christian wasn't because we were not part of the country. We've been there for 7,000 years why they hated us. They see us as Westerners bringing Christianity and they want to eliminate us. So we have a common enemy. My message to the West is people need to be aware. People need to understand, even though I was born in the Middle East, you and I have a common enemy and we need to fight that common enemy uh, accordingly. Thanks for talking with us, Mona. I think we've all learned a lot. Thank you so much, Steve. And I appreciate you uh, also giving us the opportunity to be able to witness, really it's a witness to what's going on in the world and to make people aware that we need to be standing at attention at all times. Mona Oshana is the author of Look Beyond the Fire. It's available for major booksellers. You can hear her program, The Mona K Show, on KXEG, 1280 AM, The Trumpet. It's on from 4 to 5 p.m. weekdays, Arizona time. If you live outside the Phoenix area, you can listen online at 1280trumpet.com. This is Steve Eastman for Wait Till You Hear This. Discover more stories like this one on our website, waittillyouhearthis.com. you hear this.com.